Hey, hello. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, I don't know, good evening, uh, some places. Uh, we are here to discuss a very, very important topic today. And uh, let me first of all uh, thank uh, Horasis uh, for giving us this opportunity to discuss uh, a very important topic, life work uh, balance. Uh, special thanks to Frank Jurgen, uh, uh, who has been kind enough uh, to invite us uh, again and again uh, to contribute on different topics uh, on different platforms like Horasis Global, Horasis Asia. Uh, and uh, this is Horasis Asia conference uh, where we would be discussing uh, certain topics uh, related to the regions as well as uh, uh, globally how this particular concept has been affected uh, due to pandemic. The topic is relevant whether pre or post COVID. You know, we have been discussing all along in our professional lives, uh, how to really create or plan this uh, work-life balance. And not more than uh, 50 or 40% people have been successful, statistics wise or the studies or the researches which uh, say it. More than 50 to 60% people have been uh, struggling to plan uh, life work balance even pre-COVID and post-COVID certainly the things have changed drastically and uh, we have been uh, facing a whole lot of challenges and uh, be it uh, uh, work from home, uh, be it uh, uh, business recession, uh, be it uh, mental health, uh, depression, uh, be it lifestyles, travels uh, and whatnot. Now, in while we are going through all these uh, problems, uh, Naturally, uh, situations uh, need to be under control. And for that purpose, uh, a person or a professional or a personality has to be totally stable and balanced. And this is where work and life has to be planned uh, properly. And uh, accordingly, one has to chart out a path for success or for coming out of uh, this particular pandemic very, very positively and uh, creating a ecosystem which will help uh, most of us. To discuss this particular topic, I have a distinguished uh, uh, panel members, uh, uh, basically Anthony Shan uh, from uh, UK presently, otherwise from Hong Kong. I have uh, Ms. Anne Hong uh, from uh, Boston. I have Mr. Kevul Handa from Mumbai, and I have Mr. Saurav Sinha from New York. The uh, introduction part of it i will leave it to the panelists and uh, i hope uh, we will uh, come around with certain concepts or perspectives on this particular topic and uh, not wasting too much of time i would uh, request uh, uh, saurav to start his uh, presentation uh, with a brief introduction in the beginning so that the audience knows okay very good so First off, I'd like to thank the conference organizers for convening this great panel and bringing together so many vibrant minds to discuss the important topic about work-life balance and longevity in the workplace. As background, my name is Saurabh Sinha. I'm trained as a biochemist and biomedical scientist, and I'm a partner at the Longevity Vision Fund, the largest longevity-focused venture fund investing in therapeutics, medical devices, and diagnostics and medical innovations that can help extend the healthy human lifespan. Now, over the last 200 years, science and medicine have radically expanded life expectancy. Science and medicine have broken the cycle of infectious diseases, improved sanitation, controlled diseases like HIV, and now attempting to control COVID-19. In 1900, life expectancy was 46. By 1950, it was 66. And by 2000, it was 77. And with the rapid innovations in longevity, we're expected to continue and increase lifespan to 100 and beyond. And in just about 10 years, we'll see what's called longevity escape philosophy which means for every one year you live, medical science will be able to extend your life more than one year. So what does that mean? How long can we live? To 100, to 120, 150, 250? Is it possible to even live forever? But it's not just important to live longer, but live healthier. We don't want to live like we're 95 for the next 200 years. We want to live like we're 35 for the next 200 years with all our mental, physical, and emotional faculties intact. And now we're starting to uncover the exact biochemical processes that are driving aging. So if you think about a 30-year-old man and a 30-year-old woman who decide to have a baby together, that's a 30-year-old sperm cell and a 30-year-old egg cell forming a fertilized egg. But the baby doesn't come out 30 years old. The baby actually comes out zero days old. So there's something that's actually programmed and hardwired into our genes that can turn back the hands of time. One of our partners, Dr. David Sinclair, who is the director of the Glenn Center for the Aging, uh, Biology of Aging at Harvard Medical School, 
has shown that these pathways can be harnessed and activated through what's called cellular reprogramming, to reverse the age of nearly any organ in life. <coughs> One day, to potentially reverse the biological age of humans over and over and over again. So then the question becomes not just how long can we live, but how long we want to live. And with a radically extended life expectancy and populations regularly living to 150 and beyond, what exactly do we think the world and our lives look like? If we could live as active, contributing members of society well into our 200s, could we imagine having say, multiple careers? Would we have work sabbaticals where every 10, 20 years we could transition to another completely un unrelated profession? Could you be an artist for the first 30 years, a doctor for the next 30 years, and then maybe after that become a programmer, and then after that become an, a an astronaut? You know, that could actually become a real possibility for us in the future. At Longevity Vision Fund, we're piloting the first corporate longevity program to support longevity in the workplace. And we're finding really amazing results by partnering with large companies and have more than 300,000 employees as part of this program. The corporate longevity program includes five simple steps. So step one, supporting the regular health checkups of your employees. So providing telemedicine services for employees to get checked multiple times a year to catch cardiovascular disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, all the largest disease killers at their earliest, most treatable states. Step two is helping employees quit bad habits. That's supporting smoking cessation programs and other uh, services to eliminate unhealthy habits. Step three is longevity nutrition, making it easy for employees to have access to healthy plant-based foods and supplements in the workplace. That might even mean replacing and restocking vending machines with fruits and vegetables. Step four is physical activity, supporting fitness programs and gym memberships, providing wearables like Apple Watches or Fitbits to help track their progress, I'm wearing my whoop band, which collects all of my health information. I hope you can see that. Uh, and I make sure I'm getting my 10,000 steps a day. And step five is peace of mind. Make it easy for your employees to access mental health services, meditation apps like Muse and Headspace to reduce stress levels and prevent burnout. The results of the corporate longevity program have been nothing short of amazing. The early results are showing an added 1,000 years of collective lifespan added for the workforce, 15% increase of reported happiness levels, and on average, one less sick day a year for each employee. And the corporations out of all of this benefit the most. For every $1 invested into the, in, into the longevity of their employees, that results in $3 of increased value realized for the company. And even more than companies, governments should be the most incentivized to take care of the longevity of their people. Dr. Dave, David Sinclair and Dr. Andrew Scott of London Business School showed that for every one year of life extension of the U.S. population would add $38 trillion to the U.S. economy. And that's only for one year of extended longevity. Ten years of extended longevity, which is def definitely possible, would add $365 trillion to, to the U.S. And those numbers would be even larger for countries like China with larger aging populations. With these types of astronomical numbers, we could see countries heavily investing into extending longevity for their citizens and even seeing an age race, much like the space race of the late 60s. But rather than wait for the support of governments or companies, we can realize that our longevity is in our control. In fact, about 93% of your lifespan is dependent on your lifestyle, and 7% just on your genes. Everything else is up to us. Good friend and colleague, Dr. Dina Radnikov, always says, know your numbers, meaning know your cholesterol levels, vitamin D levels, resting heart rate, how many steps you're walking each day, all this health data that's available to us to manage our own health. Other general rules to look after ourselves, while we don't quite yet have a magic longevity pill, is don't smoke, don't overdrink, eat the right foods, exercise, build meaningful, deep relationships with those around you. And that's actually a very important one. And all of those things together will add an extra 15 years to your life. On top of that, getting good sleep is very important. Longevity genes control sleep and vice versa. Really all health metrics improve with great sleep. Staying active and exercising to maintain muscle mass, especially later in life, is very important. More muscle mass can help your hormones maintain healthy levels as you age. And if you fall, that muscle helps you bounce back up rather than break a bone in old age. Eating the right food is important, but also precisely when you eat is more important and going to have real benefits for longevity. Compressing the time when you're consuming food and fasting for parts of the day makes a very beneficial change to your metabolism, keeps blood sugar levels low, and activates the defense systems in your body that prevent disease and slows aging. Most days I try to have one meal a day, and sometimes I'll fast up to 48 hours continuously per week. And the best part is that this doesn't need any special pills or intervent interventions. It's simply a behavioral change. And you don't even need to change what you're eating, just when you're eating. So hopefully I've given you some of the tools not just to extend your healthy longevity, but the mindset to create a life worth extending for yourself and your family. And thank you, and happy Thanksgiving, everyone.
Thank you, sir. Uh, it's a very important uh, uh, perspective that you have brought in. Age certainly is becoming a criterion today. What we had as regulations that we used to retire people at 55, it got extended to 58, now it has got extended to 60. Now, the life expectancy has gone up for, from uh, 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 earlier days, 70 to 85. People are mostly crossing 90s. And like you said, that the medical sciences has been extending lifespans, and then it could go 100. And there are some people who are having 100 plus, especially in Japan and other countries where uh, living is uh, absolutely fantastic. Now, when we are discussing this age-related extensions, the span, the retiring at the age of 60 and uh, surviving till 85, 25 years, what will someone do? Uh, there will be a large amount of vacuum which will be created because all along 40 to 45 years after your graduation, post-graduation, 25 till 60, 45 years you have worked uh, tirelessly 24-7 um, uh, if required sometimes and then gone ahead and suddenly you apply breaks and then you find yourself doing nothing or maybe doing something which may not be a routine job will create a problem as far as life and work is concerned. And therefore, uh, uh, this is where uh, one of the important points which you uh, brought about, that governments must take cognizance of this, that the life expectancy when it has gone up, the retirement age also has to go up and the kind of work which is allotted to people beyond a particular age uh, has to also change, meaning what you could do at the age of 40 or 25 or 60 or 70 could be of different form, involving less physical uh, torture or physical activity, uh, more of a mental activity, more of an administrative activity or things like that. Having said all that, uh, maybe uh, this is uh, a, a very, very important perspective which our audience uh, will definitely like it. I would shift to Anthony for giving us a flavor of uh, Asian, uh, specifically related to Chinese uh, 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 situation uh, related to life-work balance. We know that people work a lot uh, as far as Asia is concerned. The number of hours are beyond 48. Sometimes they are 50, 60. Uh, I would like to pick up uh, your mind on uh, the life-work balance uh, pre and post-COVID both. Thank you. Thank you, Shalendra. And it was very interesting to hear uh, Suvan's um, uh, analysis um, just now. Uh, so I'll just add mine in. Um, the only basic um, jurisdiction I know quite well is um, China. So I'll just maybe just focus on China, which of course is one of is is a large population jurisdiction, no doubt. Um, well, China is always in the news for controlling population. And in doing so, it tries to, um, you know, obviously uh, the life, the sort of the, the balance between life and work is very much in the minds of the government. Um, and even today, as we speak, it tries to, bal to, to make a balance. I would say it started um, in terms of the policies. The, the, the most distinctive policy, of course, started, I think, in the reign of, um, if you like, uh, Deng Xiaoping in the 1980, when it introduced the one-child policy. You know, that is, again, you know, uh, uh, I would say a life-shattering <laughs> or life-inducing uh, policy uh, that China had to take. Otherwise, they feel that the whole population will starve and all that. So, so obviously, that policy gave rise to a number of effects uh, which the government are trying to control, like it or not. Now, um, um, even though it's historical, I have to start with that because that is really the start of many other follow-up policies. Um, it, it, that that policy started um, in 1980, okay, and created a, if you like, imbalance in the family relationships because it created essentially um, undue pressure on the young to look after elderly parents. And usually, you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big issue when it comes to expenses. Of course, in the meantime, China has grown tremendously. It's one of these, what we call economic miracles of any nation in the last 40 years. But if you then fast forward uh, these for 40 years, you'll see the problems arising. One of which is that China has now found, and it's been all over the news recently, 
that the population is, uh, at least the younger population has been decreasing and the government has had difficulty persuading couples uh, to have more kids. Um, and they, of, of course, they, they, they have instituted a, a two-child policy, okay, thinking that uh, any well-meaning young couple would immediately start to reproduce and the population would rise. Unfortunately, uh, in today's uh, life work balance, as it were, um, most couples are very keen to make sure that sole kid at that time anyway would have the best um, upbringing possible. Okay, uh, what that had meant is, as, at least in the major cities, um, that um, um, that people had invested heavily in, for example, the child's education, because as you know couples tend to revolve their life uh, around their kid, given that they can only have one. Now that they have two, what the government has recently found out after extensive surveys and research and feedback is that the couples are saying to the government, look, uh, it's really expensive here to raise a kid and we don't want our kid not to have, our first, our second kid, as it were, not to have the same opportunities and the same investment, as it were, than the first. So when they're not going to have a second kid. So so this has, if you like, encouraged the government to implement a number of policies um, to, if you like, adjust back what they believe would be the correct life uh, work balance uh, for the community. Okay, so one of the most recent things you've seen and I'll deal with uh, elderly uh, slightly later, but one of the most important uh, legislation policies that have come out in the last half year was a control on education processes for kids. Because the way the government then tried to do this adjustment was to essentially clamp down on all, literally all, extracurricular tuition for kids, like Tomorrow, you cannot have extracurricular tuition for kids on school curriculum projects. Now, that is the sort of extent, as you like, the government would go to control. And now that causes a very big shift in the way parents deal with their kids, parents deal with their life, okay, um, et cetera, et cetera, you can imagine. And that has been somewhat uh, regarded as a big earthquake in the education sector. Okay, even though technically it hasn't got anything to do with older age, it does because that's the way the government wants to regulate, as it were, how people have kids and how many kids they have. So, so that that's one thing. The second thing is, as we all know, um, uh, China is grappling, and as with most countries, grappling grappling with a fast aging population. And and again, everyone talks about it, but uh, the question is, how does China deal or wishing to deal with an aging population? Now, the aging population has a few uh, parameters. The first one is, of course, what we call the retirement age that you already have uh, alluded to. The, the retirement age currently um, in in um, uh, in in China is uh, sixty for men, fifty for women uh, in enterprises, um, uh, and fifty five for some reason for women civil servants. Okay, so that's a bit of inequality, but that's the way it is. Um, and unfortunately, these limits were established in the nineteen fifties when China wasn't what it is now. So realistically, um, um, at that time, um, the life expectancy was much lower. Now, of course, if you look at the life expectancy of this country, it's, um, it's around 75 years old, okay? Um, and of that, around 12% of the population are already over 65 years old, okay? So, so obviously, uh, the government has to do a lot to help or to assist in people getting older. Uh, it is not so easy in China because first you have an extensive um, um, difference between what I call a rural and urban population. Secondly, people travel extensively for work. So there is a big migrant 
population. Um, and thirdly, the fact is um, the and and this is something China has already acknowledged quite openly is that they haven't done very well when it comes to pension and medical uh, uh, situations or support uh, for the masses. In fact, healthcare is one of the biggest issues the government continues today to grapple with. And healthcare is a, is a big issue that a lot of, I think, well-meaning investors um, uh, or, or social um, uh, helpers wish to improve on when it comes to China. Um, healthcare is not, even though the system technically is a very socialist type system, um, it, 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 uh, if you don't have money in China, you just die on the way to a hospital, if you ever get to a hospital. So, so, so it is, it is not, it is not a system that, um, currently is, uh, is highly protective of the community. Now, with China, uh, they have, um, you know, essentially, um, um, you know, China has a social system that allows, you know, that, that has mandatory pension, contributions, there are certainly uh, quite a lot of labor laws that are in place. The question at the end of the day is to what extent there's any coverage, both on the pension side as well as the labor um, protection side. Uh, the reality is, even though technically, uh, for example, um, you know, you will see from um, the, the, the statistics that maybe over 90% of people are covered, for example, by some sort of medical pension, the reality is that, and, and this from, is from what I read from the statistical information I have, is the reality is that a person, if he is covered under that, is only entitled to about 120 US dollars of hospital care um, every year. So that in itself isn't going to get anyone through the door in any hospital if you fall ill. Okay, so you 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 have to save essentially for for healthcare in China in a big way, in the same way as parents have to share uh, to 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 save for the kids' education. So so I think China at the moment is going through extensive, I would say, very extensive challenges at the moment, uh, which I don't actually know how they would actually deal with. I know, um, in terms of um, go, go, going um, more more aged from time to time, the government does have a lot of um, a support, if you like, or at least uh, on paper for the elderly um, population. But it is it remains a deep, and very, uh, I would say, disturbing situation. And when people grow old, they grow old very quickly. You know, so so as you know, um, uh, when people get old and have medical situations, the medical situations do uh, do establish quite quickly. So this is one of the things that I think China continues to grapple with, and I, I don't think it's that different from the rest of the world, except that the population is so much bigger. Okay, on that, I'll stop here. I'll, I'll let uh, to see if anyone wants to chip in with discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, very well brought out uh, the Chinese perspective. Uh, as far as India is concerned, uh, what we say is that more than 55% population is young. It's around 25%. And uh, uh, we don't have that kind of a problem where the older generations or the older population is uh, overtaking the younger ones. And that is where the future of uh, countries uh, like India is considered to be very, very bright because uh, this is the workforce which is going to be available in the next five to ten years uh, to increase uh, the total uh, GDPs or the economy uh, of the nation. Now, having said that, uh, I personally feel that our parents or our grandparents had large families and they did very well as far as life-work balance is concerned. Whereas, if uh, we really look at uh, the generations now or for uh, the next generations, so we have a small uh, absolutely nucleus families where we have only one or two children. Uh, whereas uh, earlier it used to be a larger family. Second aspect is that I have found that life work balance is more uh, 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 planned or organized as far as the rural areas are concerned. The urban population really struggles on uh, planning of uh, life work balance. Having uh, understood uh, the Chinese perspective, I would go to Anne. 
to understand uh, what is it in Boston or in U.S. as far as uh, life-work balance is concerned. Thank you. Um, so again, my name is On. I'm the CEO of a company called Janicare, and it's a medical device company. Um, and what it's kind of interesting um, in your question is that my country, uh, my company, we're about 60 people uh, split between the U.S., Boston, and India. And and what we do as a company is we actually work on improving, um, I wouldn't say work-life balance, but mainly life balance for our patients. So um, when I say patients, we're talking about patients that are suffering from diabetes, chronic kidney disease, heart failure. So um, typical chronic um, diseases. And what we do as a company to uh, to address that is we have this really nice small little portable device. And this device is able to measure your blood biomarker using just a finger stick of blood. And why we think about it from the life balance side is that when you think of patients that have these multi, uh, diseases, for example, you, if you have diabetes, 30% of diabetes patients tend to have chronic kidney disease. So uh, in order to manage these patients, they tend to have to go into the clinic very often in order for the doctors or the physicians to um, tither or, or change the lever of their treatments, right? Um, determine if their therapy is appropriate for where they are in their disease today. So how we as a company address this life balance is that um, you know, typically, if you have a multitude of these diseases, your ability to um, comply with the logistics that's associated with these clinical visits. So, for an example, if you have chronic kidney disease, um, a lot of these patients that are in the later stages tends to have to go into the clinic at least once or twice per month. So if you think about it from somebody that has, you know, diabetes and and heart failure and, and chronic kidney disease, these patient profiles tends to be, you know, would have a harder time with mobility, for an example, and, and a harder time coordinating these cares. So oftentimes they need somebody that can um, do all the logistics and, and have a nurse, you know, on hand. So how our company fixes that is we enable a, tele, uh, a telehealth um, remote patient management. So technically a doctor can get on the other screen, talk to the patients about how they're doing, uh, walk them through a finger stick and get their blood work on the screen at the same time. And um, why that's really important for today is as everybody can imagine with uh, the event of the pandemic in the US at least, and I, I believe also globally, the way how we think through medicine and medical um, treatment has shifted towards a more convenient approach, more telehealth approach. So uh, I bet the majority of you on the screen, your last visit with the doctor in this pandemic is through another uh, one of these screens or a Zoom case. So because of that, um, if you look at in the US with CMS as being the lead um, payer for a lot of the elderly care or patients with these chronic diseases, CMS has put in new policies regarding reimbursements of these telehealth um, services. So now it enables a doctor to get on a screen for 20 minutes a month and use our platform in that 20 minute can get their can get their blood panel read and for the doctors to provide a clinical um, result. Why I think this all fits in and appropriate for the discussion today is it talks about um, life balance, right? So from the patient side, we're working towards giving them that life balance, especially in the midst of pandemic, where many of these patients are worried about increased exposures and worry about going into the clinic when they're already struggling with compliance. On the life work balance on the company side, I, I, I find it very interesting that we're we're discussing this tonight, and ironically, for you know me as a Bostonian and our other friend, the New Yorker, it's almost 10 p.m. on Thanksgiving evening. So this is when we're supposed to be, you know, having our work-life balance and then, you know, and, and and sharing, you know, family time. But if you look through the pandemics uh, and coming out of the pandemics, I think most people would agree that work-life balance is different, right? Um, I, I think, you know, with our company being in global, right, being in two countries, we're already being forced to have to be more flexible with how the organizations is um, 
um, how we communicate and manage as an organization. Now, in the light of pandemics, traveling gets really difficult. I'm supposed to be in India in three days and coordinating the requirement to fly into India, for an example, right? Having a COVID testing within, you know, three days, but the flight takes a whole day, right, to, to, to get there. How do you coordinate all of that logistics? So it forces us as a, as a company to be more flexible with um, the, the way we manage. But I think if... I would agree that the most people on this panel, when we take executive positions within our company, with the convenience of um, telecommunication and, and remote working, I find that it is harder to have a balance in, in work life. I find it harder to because the computer is so accessible, right? In the past, you would have to go into the office, find time with your colleagues, have a sit down and you do your work after dinner. Now I find that with a comp managing a company now that is in two different time zone, I start at 6 a.m. for calls, right, with, with my colleagues in India and end up working all the way through, you know, to the evening with my U.S. counterparts. So I'm, I'm curious to hear, you know, from everybody on this panel if, you know, right now our, the conversation for discussion is work-life balance in the future, meaning post-pandemic. Um, where I'm seeing and experiencing is that from an employee side, I do see more balance for my employee in that they're able to do their data, data analysis and the, the, you know, some of that work at home and then in works that they have to go into the lab. Because, again, we are a, a healthcare company, a medical device company. They're able to go into the into the, the our facility. However, from a management side, I, I find that work-life balance is getting a little bit more difficult. And I find that I have to purposely budget in, you know, block my calendar for the balance side of, of work-life balance. So I'm kind of curious to hear what everybody's perspective is on that. Thank you, Anne, and greatly appreciate what you're doing. And certainly a couple of points uh, which I would like to add to what you have uh, talked about is that world has virtually become flat, no boundaries, and uh, a global perspective that everyone has uh, been taking, exchanges of uh, products and services uh, is certainly there on cards. And that is where I think communication uh, plays uh, a very, very important part of it. Uh, in the last two, two and a half years, uh, most of us haven't virtually seen an aircraft or for that matter, attempted traveling. I was thinking of traveling in January, thinking that everything is opened up and again, Europe is down and uh, I may not get an entry into U.S., uh, although I hold a valid visa. But then the thing is that, uh, like you said, the life has become tough uh, to do businesses uh, uh, across the borders and uh, to match the time zones uh, uh, in various countries. Uh, uh, work from home uh, was another aspect uh, which really came about, and that is where uh, like you said, that the gadgets are flowing around. Uh, even in our morning walks, we have our bots uh, in our ear, which get disturbed by a phone call coming from uh, a different time zone when they are comfortable. So uh, even while doing an exercise, we are not free of gadgets. Even while uh, having dinners or lunches or breakfast, we don't have uh, a gadget-free lunch or this thing. Although there are several satires on WhatsApp uh, which keep coming where somebody has to really surrender their mobile phones before they have lunches or dinners in houses, in restaurants and things like that. But then I think uh, we find it very, very hard. I fully agree with you that the gadgets are very, very easily accessible even to kids. Uh, my uh, grandson, who's two years old, is familiar with how to operate a mobile or how to operate a laptop. So things are going to be very, very tough uh, as far as uh, these things are going to be concerned. But nevertheless, I think uh, everything has its own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and we have to look at it, uh, the positive uh, side of it. And uh, to discuss more on this uh, work from home, or for that matter, life work balance during this uh, two years of pandemic. I have Kevul here from Mumbai. Uh, who would like to throw some light on that? Kevul. So, so, thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me for this conference. Uh, I'm a former CEO of Pfizer in India, and I'm also the former uh, executive director, chairman of Union Bank of India. Uh, in in nineties, somewhere in nineties, uh, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, then Prime Minister, did realize that uh, the Indian population. Uh, needs some relief 
and some balance in work life. So he announced uh, five days a week for work. And for the government, uh, it was uh, like every alternate Saturday was an off. Uh, so this thought perhaps was there because he felt that the Indians work much longer and they stay much longer in the office. And, and there is some challenge of work-life balance. Now, you, the companies tried to do something there. After that, they gave some flexi timings. For some companies, it did work. For some companies, it didn't work. But not enough was done by the companies to ensure individual work-life balance. Let me make it very clear. The company left it to the individuals to define what is a work-life balance for themselves. Now came the pandemic. And a pandemic, we almost lost about 7.4 million jobs. And those jobs are completely gone. And they are coming back. But those who have got the job also is passing through a mental torture. It's, 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 it's insecurity that has created it. Uh, there is a recent report by, by McKinley which says that almost about uh, those who surveyed, 19% of the surveyed guys said uh, that they want to come back to the office will be very positive. positive. But 49% of the surveyed said coming back to the office is not possible. It may have a negative impact. That's quite telling as to what's wrong to come back to the office. Uh, is, is the culture of the organization not suited uh, for people to work in the office? Uh, or the organization doesn't have a compassion for employees? I think that's a big discussion that we need to have in the work-life balance today. Is, is what the organization are doing towards the kindness or the compassion for their employees to make them more comfortable being either at home or at the office. And that, to my mind, is the biggest challenge to the organization are facing. But unfortunately, what the organizations are doing is simply doing either a full work from office or an hybrid system without realizing it, there is some intervention required for individual work-life balance. And that intervention is, is in terms of your culture, your leadership, showing the right path for the employees. There is a survey by the, uh, by in Canada, which was done by the Organization Culture of Canada, uh, Public Service uh, Service of Canada. It says, when there is kindness, people work 25% or more energetic, 30% or more motivated, and 44% are more committed. That's a great take for an organization. Having 44% of the people committed is a big, big take to the organization. So what's the lesson for all of us who run the organization is, is you want to devise a future work-life balance. You need to take an active life, active part in it. First, define what type of culture you want to have. You want to have a culture in the office, back to the same, more meetings, more targets, and creating more mental pressure on employees. Or you want to have a culture which is where is where is which is very flexible, which is transparent, and leave individuals to take their uh, responsibilities and accountability. I think that's where it is. Then the other thing is communication. How do you communicate? You feel uh, you, uh, you 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 value your employees. How do you communicate that? A lot of the people don't communicate they value their employees. It's very critical. I was in one of the uh, session the other day, and very young person who was created. Uh, ripples in the stock exchange market by having a platform uh, which, which serves millions of people who want to trade in shares. He says, I don't have any revenue targets for my employees. This is a different culture. There is no revenue targets for employees. How they are measured? They are measured on their responsibility to their customers. This is a different way of looking at it. And what's the payoff? The attrition. Is a minimum attrition, yes. And who joins the organization? The young people. Now, these are the thoughts with the organization that you put in now. Very seriously, think about it. If we want to have a good, committed, motivated people in the organization, what type of a culture do you want to be? So if you want to even, let's say from here, an organization says that I want to go into a new hybrid structure of office plus work then you need to realize that when you go into a hybrid structure, you are more responsible and you are more committed to ensure that the systems in both places work. The infrastructure is available. And unfortunately, that is the biggest challenge 
in India is the place of work at home. People do not have place of work at home. There's a lot of disturbance. And in spite of that, people saying 49% people say they don't want to go back. Now, that clearly shows that the culture, uh, the structure, infrastructure, the way we conduct ourselves in offices need to dramatically change. Only when this change happens, mentally a person can think about work-life balance. You can think of work-life balance only when you're mentally sound. Or when you're comfortable at the office, then you talk or think about your life. But if you're not comfortable at the office, you're always tense. And where is the life going? I think, I think that's the biggest question that, that one should ask. And I, I, I really want the leadership today. Just don't fall into the rut. Come back, boys, uh, girls, and start working. Think about how do you want to create the future work-life balance. You, the leaders, need to intervene and create that environment where both the employees and the managers are comfortable and they have a good work-life balance. I think I leave it there, paucity of time, and hand over to the board. Thank you, Kevil. Uh, very interesting perspective. And uh, I think we are left with a couple of minutes, but then nevertheless, uh, we'll wind it up uh, with closing remarks uh, 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 from uh, Sauro. Just a quick closing remark. Yeah, I agree with uh, you know everything that Kevil and Anne and uh, um, you know our colleagues have said. Uh, it's all on the employers and uh, all of us together and supporting your employees and making sure that there's a safe environment where you can take the time you need and have the mental headspace you need to preserve your work-life balance. And then also that pays dividends into the future because when you're back in the office, you're working harder, you know that the company cares about you and you're going to work harder for that company in, uh, because of that um, as a result. So uh, yeah, learned a lot here today. Thank you for having me. And um, yeah, looking forward to more conversations. Uh, and. Yeah, thank you. I, I echo everything. Um, thank you for the opportunity to participate tonight. I do agree that, you know, work-life balance is very important just for, you know, if anything else, for sustainability, right? We can't, um, in order for us to have a productive future, we have to make sure that whether it's hybrid or in-person or remote, it needs to be sustainable. Well, uh, thanks a lot, uh, panel members. Uh, it has been wonderful. Uh, thank you for all your perspectives, which have been uh, put forward uh, very, very openly. And uh, I enjoyed uh, discussing with uh, you all. Look forward to discussing similar topics in future. Thank you, Horasis, and a happy Thanksgiving to uh, everyone around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.